Good morning, friends. Do you ever put off a project you've actually been kind of excited about just because other stuff keeps popping up? Because same. And that is what we will endeavor to make a start on today. The project that I have in mind is a circa 1900s Norwegian inspired pocket. And I say inspired because many of the extant pockets we have from this era look like this, and this, and this. A design which is still carried forward into the Norwegian bunads of today. This was the kind of silver clasp that I initially set out to find, only they are still popular among bunad folk and often full silver, so a bit out of my price range for this project. That was until I stumbled upon this oval silver-plated curiosity from this lovely grandmother, who in turn had inherited it from her mother, neither of which had managed to find the time to embroider a pocket for it. With both the history she shared with me and the Scandinavian Art Nouveau details of the lid, we can place it quite confidently in the early 1900s. It has a sturdy chain to either hold or hang from one's skirt, and even a small mirror on the inside, and the many little holes to attach a pocket bag to. I bought it, thinking for sure that I would be able to find something similar among the copious references to pockets and purses in Norway's extensive digital museum, but no such luck. Hours of scrolling returned only this single coin purse of vaguely similar oval shape, but nothing else. Stumped, I turned my search outward and was eventually able to find something similar in the oval tam o coin purses used in the Victorian-era United Kingdom. But these didn't usually come with a sturdy chain, since it was commonly kept within a larger purse, so an extant Norwegian tam o inspired type pocket clasp adapted to suit local preferences and sensibilities? Clasp mystery still unsolved, I nevertheless decided to continue with my little project. And because pockets are so small, they present ideal fabric scrap busting opportunities. I have quite a bit of this dark grey mottled wool that will be familiar if you spend any amount of time on this channel, as well as a smallish piece of canvas to help stiffen and strengthen the thin wool, similar to what I've seen used on only the embroidery sections of extant embellished aprons. Finally, I have this rather ratty looking leftover warp from a weaving project way before this channel, the wool is this really high quality, four strand strong stuff and plant dyed to perfection by a true artisan of her craft. I really couldn't bring myself to cut it down to stuffing when I couldn't weave anymore. But you know what? The threads are quite a suitable length for embroidery. The embroidery I will be taking inspiration from is this embellished apron from Telemark that has what looks to me like stylized oak leaves that I rather liked. I am not going for reproduction here. My embroidery skills are not up for that. First, of course, we have to measure the circumference of this unyielding metal shape. Since this pocket clasp is not like anything I could find, I am opting out of the traditional pear-shaped front and back pieces, and instead calling back to the oval shape by marking and cutting five small trapezoid pieces out of my wool scraps. I will be handling these pieces a lot, so thread marking all the chalk lines is quite necessary. Next, I am using sundry household objects to draw out the shape of the oak leaves on each piece. These shapes are then also thread marked for added permanence. Before we stitch all our pieces together. 
that is, all except that last seam that will turn this from a roughly half circle shape to a cone, because the latter does not sound like a good time to embroider. With my pocket stitched and pressed, I am laying it over my canvas. Keeping my lines straight means I can do this and reduce the number of inner seams. If I had gone for pear-shaped pieces, we would have had quite a different story. I also opted to baste my canvas to my wool, as this will keep the canvas from sliding around until we have thoroughly embroidered it in place. And with all that done, we can finally start our embroidery. The center was some kind of net stitch, which we mimic with wide back stitches alternating the left and right sides. The original had only orange and red in their leaves, but since I had this beautiful yellowish green, I thought it would make a nice transition to the birch yellow and then matter red. I am just covering my lines with dense satin stitches, making sure that I am going through to the canvas layer as well, but not pulling too hard as to create puckering and bulging of the fabric. Let me tell you, a thimble is always necessary, but with this kind of embroidery, it becomes even more necessary. My fingers were battered and bruised after marathon working on this project for a week, even with my trusty thimble to hand. With our leaves finished, we can continue on to some sort of connecting vine structure. This part will be nothing like the original, since my leaves are very closely spaced, but we will make something all the same. First, by calling back to the white of the core. Yeah, so these little... I want to call them picos, but I'm not really sure what they're called, are in nowhere near turning out as cute as in the original, but... You know what? Imperfection was a thing in history, and we are going to represent all the people who just liked doing things, but who weren't necessarily expert at everything, so... Still kind of cute, but... We're gonna keep going. After white, I did a similar callback to the light yellowish green before going for the deep green and blue left in my erstwhile warp pile. And with that, we are almost done with the embroidery part of this stash-busting project. We still have that last back seam to stitch up, which also needs that wine-ish connecting pattern in white, greens and blue. And yes, I was just as glad as I thought I would be that I hadn't stitched this up in the beginning. But then we are only left with the assembly. First, by folding down the edges on top to give a clean transition between fabric and metal, before tracing the bottom circle from a suitably large piece of scrap fabric. I wanted the bottom to have a similar heft to the body, so I pieced together what leftovers we made earlier, which turned out to be an excellent fit before backstitching the bottom to the body with tight backstitches, ensuring that I can safely hold many exciting treasures at any one time. The edges of which are folded down to either side and carefully stitched to avoid my white linen thread showing to the front. Yes, these are severely curved, but no, it was not much of a problem. A little finagling and they all behaved. Last up, we have the all-important actually attaching the pocket bag to the pocket clasp part. The pocket is now entirely done, no seam allowances left to fold down or otherwise fight through the very unflexible metal clasp. Which, 
for some reason I thought would be a good idea to attach aiming for each tiny hole from the back, which is not at all efficient. There you go. Underneath from the back and through the hole from the front. Much easier. And with that, I'm going to call her done. All that embroidery means she has no problem maintaining an upright position all on her own, and neither chain nor clasp seems to suffer when suspended mid-air. Since this pocket didn't come with a hook to hang it from your skirt, I did find one separately and it feels just as sturdy as the rest of it. So there you have it. One Victorian era, but very much Norwegian inspired wool embroidery pocket. Perfect for adding a pop of color and extra inventory space to just about any outfit. Also usable as a purse, but who wants to have to hold on to something all day? No, I would much rather keep my hands free to explore what wonderful secrets the world has in store for us. Until next time!